Okay, so um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Felix Padron. I was a student here at Color Salbiso. I'm also supervising the Goodman uh, Clinic. Wonderful clinic, by the way. Um, I have to say that because my director's here. And because I mean it, right? Um, but it's a wonderful place. Um, and for those of you who know me, sorry, <laughs> I'll be the one doing the training. So we'll get, we'll get through it, okay? Um, thank you for being here. I know it's not usually a topic that's very um, exciting, but a topic that has to be addressed because of all the effects that, that it could um, create and cause for a university, an institution like ours, and also for you personally. Because people often assume that if there's a lawsuit for sexual harassment, it just goes to the agency, the employment place. But it can also be from the, a civil lawsuit against you if you're the one doing the harassment. So understand that, which sometimes people aren't aware of that. So today, we're going to cover and under, try to understand what constitutes sexual harassment, what the definition is, learn strategies how to respond to it. As an employee and a manager know how to make the formal filing of a sexual harassment situation or complaint, how to receive it if you're a manager or supervisor, and how to do the investigative process of it. You don't have to do it alone, so it's not something you have to have memorized. We have great support here. Uh, Carmen, our HR person here on site, is wonderful about helping you through the step-by-step -step process if you need it. I hope you don't. And, it, and inevitably, we're going to review some of the university's policies on sexual harassment. It's a section that's about 11 pages long. It's not too long. It's a little bit boring in terms of legalities of the stuff, but it's something that we have to be aware of, especially if we work here, and secondly, if we're aspiring to be in supervisory positions eventually. So I want you to be aware and on top of things so that the, you're always on the top of your game. Anybody familiar with this gentleman? And I use that term loosely, gentlemen. Okay? All right, so uh, we're going to watch a small clip uh, just to kind of bring to light what sexual harassment kind of could be in all scopes. You co-hosted the Today Show with Matt Lauer for 15 years. What is Matt's most annoying habit? Uh. Mm. He pinches me on the ass a lot. <laughs> wow! I would have a problem with that. Nice to see you. Good morning, Matt. Seen a lot of you lately. <laughs> Sorry uh, about that. You were <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'd be happy to stay home, but uh, the film. <laughs> Let's just get it out of the way. You had a little wardrobe malfunction mm. the other night. What's the lesson learned from something like that, other than that you keep smiling, which you always do? Welcome to today on a Thursday morning. I'm Matt Lauer. And I'm Ann Curry, in for I guess nobody this morning. <laughs> It's nice to be able to say that, isn't it? It's, it's crazy. Most importantly, you've made us better, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And right over here is the staircase upstairs to Matt's dressing room. Matt says around this time yesterday morning, he came down the stairs, was standing about over here, getting ready for an upcoming segment, when Willie walked in, said, hey, Matt. And then Matt says he smacked him right on the tush. Do you feel victimized by this? I'm upset for a couple of reasons. One, that he denied it. I mean, why deny it? I mean, if you do it, own up to it. This man has even working hard. Uh, may have resulted in Matt dropping his guard on camera, as you can see from our new segment called Creepy Matt Lauer. Here, Michaela Scherfen won a world championship at the tender age of 17. Now she's 18. Everybody talks about how young you are, but you are no novice. You are a force. Thank you. Nice talking to you. You too. Oh, that was great. Drink it in, ladies. Again, Matt? Really? It's the third time this week. Did your mommy give you those? Oh, wow. Stop it. You're making me lactate. Yeah, get it while it lasts. fired about 10 months after Roger Ailes was let go Correct. by the network over allegations of sexual harassment. So the network understood the subject matter. 
you were probably the last guy in the world that they wanted to fire because you were the guy that the ratings and the revenues were built on. You carried that network on your shoulders for a lot of years. So doesn't it seem safe to assume that the people at Fox News were given a piece of information? All right, so um, some disturbing comments, right? And something else I find disturbing is that uh, it was kind of made fun of and made light of because usually the victims aren't the one laughing. It's usually everyone else. It's an uncomfortable topic. But this, we also have the Harvey Weinstein, of course, every political thing, all sorts of political people doing these kind of inappropriate statements and comments and, and, and behaviors. So it's rampant. Just give me a second here. Okay, so sexual harassment. You have a quiz in front of you. It's about 13 questions, I believe. You should have a quiz in front of you. You need one? Okay. If you could please fill that out. And the extras are located by Elsa. So if you could take one and please fill that out. Please do not cheat on this quiz. I have to say this in this institution quite a bit. If you wouldn't mind, just a true or false, just put the T or F right by the number. It's a true or false, go ahead and get started. We'll review it in a minute. I'm gonna give you about two or three minutes to finish that. You may have already done it, you overachievers. So in order to save some time, I'm gonna quickly just Read the first couple of, first several ones as we're doing it. Uh, number one, sexual harassment complaints are generally false or unjustified. False, right? Although there are a number that are. There are a number that might be uh, um, falsified, right? Number two, sexual harassment can occur outside the work site and still be considered work-related. Incidents that occur at retirement parties and the office socials or in a training are some of the situations where work-related harassment occurs. True or false? True. Okay, did, did someone give the quiz answers out before we... Number three, terms of endearment with coworkers such as... Huh? Uh, there's a... Th th these are mine, so yeah, sorry. Um, terms of endearment with coworkers such as honey, dear, are considered verbal abuse and charges can be brought against the employee. How many trues? Good. And how many faults is this? How many not sure? <laughs> okay, great. All right, good. We'll answer this in a second. Number four, women in professional jobs, teachers, lawyers, engineers, doctors, professors, are not as likely to be sexually harassed as women in blue-collar jobs, like fa factory workers, assistants, secretaries, truck drivers. True or false? Big faults, right? That one, right? Number five, if he didn't like the sexual tension, if, uh, and, but she meant it only as flirting or joking, then it was not sexual harassment. Okay. We'll do one more. Number six, sexual harassment is not limited to physical contact. It can occur any time that an individual is uncomfortable with another person's approach, comments, or discussions. True, right. So uh, getting back to number three, in terms of endearment. M a lot of us said true on that one as a form of sexual harassment. But the one thing that's missing is the unwelcomed factor. So if you're kind of okay joking around and okay with someone calling you dear, honey, buddy, whatever it is, then it's okay. If it's offensive to you or a bystander and they make that quite clear to you that's unwelcome, they don't like that, then you have to make a change. Otherwise, then it can't constitute sexual harassment or harassment of some sort. So we're gonna move forward here real quick. I will make sure that Carmen emails you the answers for those of you who are OCD and want to make sure that they did well on the quiz. I will make sure you get that. Promise. Okay. So, the problem, very pervasive, the problem of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment, it is assumed because not everything that reaches legal complaint status are all the cases, right? So, three out of four women and three out of four women in, in places like ours and institutions of learning and jobs do not report sexual harassment at all. They feel uncomfortable because of retaliation. They feel uncomfortable because a person who's doing it might be a popular person and they might be retaliated against by the other 
coworkers that they have. So it's an unfortunate circumstance that I don't think we have a complete and accurate um, statistic on. So the U.S. Department of Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, receives approximately close to 13,000 cases a year. In fact, in 16, it was very close to uh, 13,000 cases. Almost 84% were women, were women, and almost 17% were men following these sexual harassment cases. And the cases amounted up to upwards of $40 million in terms of hand. Remember, these are just the legal cases that went to litigation. So there are some that were um, complained, uh, the complaint was processed by the EEOC but didn't reach or didn't have enough substantiating evidence to be able to move for, forward. And there's a lot that weren't even ever uh, filed because of fear. So this is the technical definition of what sexual harassment is. The very first word is important, unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature which constitutes sexual har harassment when submission to or rejection of this conduct explicitly or implicitly affects an individual's employment, unreasonably interferes with an individual's work performance, or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. The operative word is unwelcome. If you are subject to a joke, a, a leer, a stare, a comment that you're uncomfortable with, you have to let the person know that you're uncomfortable and that it's unwelcome to please stop. You're going to hear me say this a couple of times today during the training, but um, documentation is important. Record when you said this to the person, when it happened, who was around you, because there might be important factors in filing a formal complaint if necessary. But it's important that you let the person know that it's unwelcomed. It's very important. Um, also, it could be verbal, it could be physical, it could be implicit, it could be something that... Um, might be a might be affected uh, bystander might be the person affected by it so it's not even though it's not directed if you're not the person it's directed to but are offended by what's being discussed or stated or a joke and sometimes it could be a cultural situation a a in our case it just can be an institutional cultural situation but we tend to talk a lot in the hallways and we're not aware who's around us that includes students vendors uh, maybe even some clients from the clinic that might kind of seep through and go to the restrooms here, sometimes it happens. Be cautious in terms of who you're talking around, but the person affected must tell you that they're uncomfortable and for, to please stop, and we'll get to that in a second. All right, it's a little quiz again, but a little bit more formal. Scene one, Angie wants Jack to stop flirting. Well, we started out just innocently, you know. Um, <laughs> he'd compliment me on something I had on, and uh, I'd say I liked his haircut. Just fun and friendly, and maybe a little flirty. You know, it made me feel good, and I know he liked it too. <laughs> well, it certainly made work more fun. <sighs> but then I started feeling uncomfortable, like he was taking things too seriously, and... Well, we work together, so to me, dating is completely out of the question. And I said something to him, and I've made it perfectly clear to him since then that I don't want anything romantically with him. But this morning, he whispered in my ear how wonderful I smell. I just, I don't know what to do. You know, I can't work with him anymore. I'm constantly distracted, and I keep wondering what he's going to say and do next. Is this sexual harassment? Anyone who thinks it is not sexual harassment at this point. Okay, good. Is the behavior unwanted? Yes, okay. Is it interfering with Angie's ability to do her work? You know, if you have to constantly push them away, push someone away or avoid somebody, or you feel uncomfortable at work because of you've already let the person know but they continue, it creates what we'll discuss in a moment as a hostile work environment, which is a, and, and today we're talking about sexual harassment, but we can remove that word sexual and any form of harassment that creates a hostile work environment is something that we could and, and should look into. Let's continue here real quick. 
You know, I guess I thought they were a couple. We all went out after work a few months ago, and they seemed like they were pretty close. Like, really close. I can't remember if they left together that night, but they were pretty hot and heavy when they were dancing. We all just assumed that they hooked up. But then when I asked Angie a few weeks later how things were going with her and Jack, she got really defensive. She said that they're just friends, that there's nothing romantic between them. I mean, I think Jack is a great guy. I think they make a cute couple. Can mutual attraction and potential romance become sexual harassment? Audience? Yeah, if it's unwelcomed at some point. You know, you can change your mind. You can start liking somebody and getting involved and then change your mind. So if the person you're kind of sort of involved, but involved with before continues and you said, no, I'm not interested, it's sexual harassment. It's unwelcomed. So yes, you can start in a relationship. That's why it's usually not recommended to, you know, blank where you eat, or whatever that uh, metaphor is. I'm not sure. I can't remember. <clears throat> However, we shouldn't do that because it, at all, is it, it is oftentimes confused and could create uncomfortable situations, not just for the couple who maybe hopefully is mature enough to get through it, but everyone else who has to work with them, right? So just be cautious. Right. No more soup for you. Okay. Not when it remains mutual, but when something changes. For example, if someone puts the brakes on and the other person doesn't respect that change, then you may have the start of a pattern of unwanted sexual advances, which creates the potential for hostile work environment harassment. Yeah. Yeah, she said something about needing some more space. But you know what? I think she's just scared. She told me that she's been hurt in the past by some jerks, but I'm not one of those guys. I know that there's something special between us. I could feel it the first time that we even danced together and everybody saw it. I told her I would respect her and give her some space, but I'm not gonna give up on her. She's worth the wait. Did Angie bring this on herself? Did she? Is she at fault? Okay, good. Because I don't want to be in a culture where we keep blaming the victim for what happens because of what she wore, because of what she said, because of what he said or what he wore. You know, this is not something that we need to, to continue doing because we promulgate the same thing over and over again. She was clear with Jack. Jack has some issues. I think the Goodman Center will be very good for Jack. Angie brought the romance side of this on herself by flirting. But that doesn't matter now. Regardless of what happened in the past, Jack needs to respect Angie's request at work. She wants to stop. He needs to stop. Okay, moving forward. All right, so the two different types of sexual harassment by definition are quid pro quo, which basically means something for something, this for that, right? Um, and this occurs when your promise, either promotion or a raise in pay, uh, contingent upon some sort of sexual favor, right? The other definition, the second definition of sexual harassment is hostile work environment. This is where it's more pervasive. It occurs when behavior creates some sort of hostility in the environment where it's offensive or intimidating to come into work and interferes with the individual's ability to work peacefully, okay? Remember, sexual harassment can also include third parties, so we have professors, staff here, right, employees. We also have students that come in here, potential students who come into, you know, our university to look around and take a tour. We have vendors who come here. We have speakers who come here. So anyone who steps ground on here or on an official um, university function, like graduation, for example, could have a third party complaint for sexual harassment. So when we go to graduation, and all those employees at the James Online Convention Center that work with us, if they, f they have every right to file a complaint if they feel that they have been harassed in some way, just like we have every right to file a complaint if we felt the same way, even from hotel guests. Right, so this extends far farther than what we would normally think would be part of the harassment um, circle, if you will. And remember, uh, not only can the institution be sued, but also the individual uh, whom the complaint is brought against can be civilly sued. So just be cautious with and, and aware of that. It's not limited to just advances or requests. It could be um, 
glares. Um, it could be something electronic. It could be an email. It could be a joke that's overheard. So it does. You don't have to be the victim of or the recipient of some sort of advance to be able to file a complaint, or at least file it after you've told the person, I'm not comfortable with that, please don't do that anymore. And if it continues in your department, in your general vicinity, then you can move forward with a more formal complaint. And document, document, document is very important. Document, who was there? What time was it? What day was it? Uh, what were you wearing? What were they wearing? You know, just document as much detail as possible because you're gonna need that in moving up the chain of complaints if we need to get that far. It can occur if, like we just mentioned, even if you're not directly offended, if you're not directly the recipient, and also, it's not always directed toward the opposite sex. It could be directed toward an orientation. It could be directed toward um, same sex. It could be directed toward different types of discriminations and harassment. So just be very cautious with that, please. This is another legal term that comes up in court, which is intent versus impact. Oftentimes, when this happens and when it comes up to an HR level of investigation, people tend to say, well, I didn't mean to offend anybody. So the intent wasn't to hurt, but what's important is the impact. It's how it hurt and to the extent that it hurt. So the intent is not important. The impact is important. And when we're not clear and when this goes to court or an EEOC case, they use another legal term. Um, that the term is reasonable person. So an objectively hostile or, or abusive work environment is created when a reasonable person would find it hostile or abusive. So if, if we're not clear whether a, a topic, even though a complaint may have been filed or a request for it to stop may have been discussed, we would have to run it against the reasonable person criteria. So for example, if you work in a department and you're asked every weekend on Friday or before the weekend, hey, we're going to happy hour, wanna come? That could be something that someone files a complaint about if they say, please don't ask me, or, or you know, they would have to say it's unwelcomed. But is it, for a reasonable person, perhaps a, a sexual harassing question? Right? Because if it's a group, it might be something different. So it's one of those questionable things that a reasonable person criteria will be utilized in court. But if someone says, stop asking me, you might want to stop asking them. Right? I mean, why, you know, why poke a sleeping bear kind of you know, thing? Why do that? If you, if you know that they don't like it, why continue? Right? So now it becomes harassing from another nature. It may not be sexual harassment, but it might just be harassment because it's an unwelcome, beha unwelcome behavior, even though it's not sexual in content. <clears throat> All right, behaviors that constitute uh, sexual misconduct, there's verbal, of course. We have the derogatory comments based on gender or orientation, repeated requests for dates. Uh, sexual or gender-based jokes or teasing, or teasing, whistling or cat calls. Objectifying terms or names, right? Uh, turning work discussions to sexual topics, uh, such as using puns, you gotta be cautious of that. Also we have the, just a second, the nonverbal, right? which I'm, I'm glad that we have speedy equipment here, uh, which include a staring or leering, that's nonverbal, but very uncomfortable. Looking up and down the elevator eyes, we've seen those on TV, usually hopefully not here, right? And we also have the physical components which are invading someone's personal space. Now, being in a culturally diverse university, which is awesome, right? Sometimes different cultures have different space, com space comfort, you know, the depth comfort, so you have to be very cautious that you take into account who you're speaking to. Some people like that one, one inch distance to be able to discuss, so you could share their lunch <laughs> with you, you know, because that's what you seem to be getting in your face when they're talking. Some people need a couple of feet of distance, and so you let the person know what your comfort level is. If you say, please, I, I'm like someone talking to me so close, I have, these are my, this is my personal space, you know, and they, stip, they keep invading it, and you've already said it's unwelcomed, it could constitute a, a complaint that would be, I think, a taken up by HR. Of course, accidentally brushing against someone with a sexual part, or grabbing somebody, or, you know, uninvited touching like neck massages, you know, uninvited, all right? So sometimes we might have a coworker that we feel comfortable with and that's okay, but again, maybe you two are okay, but someone else in your office is not. 
So you've got to be cautious about who you might be affecting. Seductive behaviors. We have the visuals like posters, cartoons, things that sometimes we don't use this anymore, usually, typically, but some people used to, in their workspaces, have posters and calendars, and sometimes they weren't, they weren't very appropriate. So imagine the, um, the image that we would have, perhaps, of a mechanics place, right? Because most of the mechanics that I have been to, some of the mechanics that I have been to, may have calendars that may not be appropriate. Um, but that's just, that's okay for their environment. But if someone in that environment says, I'm not comfortable with that, they, they would have to take it down or have a complaint filed against them in possible litigation, right? So um, we have some of these images. Electronic, we send emails all the time. Your emails, your texts, texts can be used against you in court. So be very cautious what you put in a recorded format. So if you don't want no one to see what you say, then they'll write it in some sort of electronic format. And if you're not sure whether it's appropriate or not, you might not want to do it anyway. So when I work with kids, I usually ask them, when they're, when, they're in, when they're in question in terms of what appropriate behavior would be, I ask them, would you do that in front of a police officer? Oh, no, <laughs> then probably you shouldn't do it at all, right? So I'm going to ask you, would you do that particular behavior that may constitute this in front of the president here? Or in front of uh, Dr. Ramos, or in front of... Uh, the HR Carmen here. If you wouldn't do that, then chances are you shouldn't be doing that. So, um, is my behavior sexual harassment? If you're not sure. The best way to avoid that and not to have to worry about it is to stay professional. You know, it's already difficult to have to sometimes come into work, not because we don't love working here, because we all love working here, but the problem is that oftentimes there's a lot of challenges in work. Your department has challenges, there's goals, there's deadlines, there's things to meet, and it's difficult enough. So why don't we make it easy for each other by respecting each other and staying professional and making this place of work a place that's enjoyable. I remember, I'm a lot older than most of you here, I'm right, the oldest person here is about 30, 35, right? Work with me. Right, so a long time ago, people would answer phones like by the third or fourth ring with a very pleasant tone and, and very inviting, sometimes because the course of what we do and the, and the hesitance of, uh, we don't do that anymore sometimes. Uh, there was a different approach when we received somebody coming into university or, or, or a business. You know, those old-fashioned uh, ways of doing business have been lost a little bit and there's been a lot of depersonalization because of all the electronics. That's a shame because it was such a nice way of doing business. It was, uh, there was a pride in that and I, I wish we could maybe hopefully bring it back. But, um, Please don't assume that your behaviors, right, are okay just because people find it funny. Your particular immediate group might find it funny, but look around for facial expressions where people may not find it comfortable. And, and maybe you might want to ask, listen, was that joke offensive to you? Because if it was, I apologize and I'll stop. You might want to do the preemptive thing, right? If you're not sure, stop immediately, right? Just don't do it anymore, right? And if in, when in doubt, don't do it. Right? So if you think you're being sexually harassed, say no very clearly. Let them know, I'm not comfortable with this. Please don't continue. Don't do it anymore. Be very specific and document. Right? Contact Carmen here uh, for support in HR just to make sure that you could follow procedures. Keep records of what the event was, who was there, who was present, what day, what location of the university was at, if it was off campus, who was there off campus, just to kind of make sure that if you need to, and hopefully you don't, but if you need to file a complaint and move it forward, you have enough information to be able to justify a complaint. And of course, report it. What if, let me see here real quick, um, what to expect from here if you need to file a report? Well, expect it to be confidential. Now, the three fastest ways of communication is telephone, television, and tell a secret, right? So if you tell a coworker by the way, don't tell anybody, but I just filed a report against Joe because before you get to your office, the secret will have preceded you and everybody knows. I'm not sure if you've noticed that here in this campus. There seems to be a, the fastest way of communication is telling a secret. So if you want to get your memos out faster, keep it in secret format. And I'm sure you get it out there. So if you have a complaint that you filed besides confidentiality, because the only people that should know is a person who feels offended and that received the unwelcome advances, right? 
the person that you're telling, which in this case would be Carmen here at HR or your supervisor, and then Carmen, but no one else should know, okay? Because it, it might water down your case if you need to take it further. Make sure it's prompt. You're gonna have a prompt res response here from Carmen, from HR. There's gonna be no retaliation here. Just because you filed the complaint and because it was kept confidential, there will be no retaliation, and it's in part, and it's in our policies, in the 11-page policy that we have here at the university. You're gonna be provided resources and how to respond and how to handle and how to lessen your hostile work environment if you're the person that's affected. And of course, you're gonna be uh, getting a refresher of the company policies and probably a copy of it to make sure that you understand what your rights are. And Carmen will be sending that out, by the way, in PDF format with a sheet of paper that says, I have received and read the policies to make sure that you know what you're getting into. So some of the barriers to reporting sexual harassment or any harassment, what if it's your boss? What if it's your supervisor? Who do you go to, right? So the first order of business, how do you justify moving forward with the complaint? What do you need to do? You need to say that the behavior is Unwelcome. Say what? Unwelcome. Thank you, Ernesto. That the behavior is unwelcomed. Right? So you have to tell your boss, I don't feel comfortable with that. I need you to stop that, please. Right? Not just with the sexual harassment, but anything else that you might think is harassing. Please give that person also their wherewithal and the information necessary to be able to make adjustments in their behavior so you're no longer feeling comfortable. Um, I know there shouldn't be retaliation, but I'm still afraid. Listen, sometimes we may not be thrilled exactly with what we have in terms of jobs at times, which I hope that isn't the case, but um, we're more afraid of not having a job. So oftentimes the fear of retaliation creates a resistance to uh, moving forward and filing a complaint. Uh, you worry that you won't be taken seriously, and I think you won't find that here, especially with Carmen. Right? If you feel that in your particular department just things don't get farther, follow the chain of command and go to HR to make sure she, she's aware. And how do you deal with the emotional stress of an investigation? Right? This is a, a big school, but a small school. And, and unless you've kept it confidential, everyone will know. So how do you deal with being ostracized by people who may feel uncomfortable with the fact that you said something? I'm gonna always encourage you to, you know, if you see something, say something, right? like we're hearing now a lot. Be because while you might be able to handle something, you don't know what your coworker's going through, what's going on in their personal life, what's going on and what kind of history they've had with assault. Um, I was working with, a, with a, a mom recently regarding the Parkland situation and what happened resurfaced her trauma that she had when she was 21, very similar situation happened to her. So we don't know who walks among us and what they carry from home. So be cautious and, and be the brave one to say something, please. No one should have to work uncomfortable. Okay, thank you. Um, so your role as a supervisor or a manager, and if you're not yet a supervisor or department head or manager, aspire to be, right? So um, your job is to prevent this from happening to respond to it when it does, and to end it. Please understand that um, the prevention part is what, kind of what we're doing. The training, the maybe talking about it, maybe every quarter, a little, co a little brief synopsis. This, I think, is gonna be recorded, um, so you might wanna do your own. So, but in the future, uh, make sure that you kind of keep the training going, because you're gonna get new employees coming in, new staff members, new team members, right? When someone comes to you with a complaint, please take it seriously and respond. Don't minimize the importance. Don't try to cover for the person that maybe the complaint was filed against because you could find yourself part of that civil lawsuit because you did nothing. And of course, end it when you, when you see it happening. Some risk factors for harassment sometimes would be the location, the proximity of how you work with somebody or where you work with somebody. Sometimes things are quite isolated. Sometimes we have people in engineering. Sometimes we might have off-site situations. So sometimes it could be, and for those of us who have students that we work with in practicum sites, that's an also another place that we need to kind of keep this in, in check with. Um, sometimes having very similar or very diverse workforces working together, we could have someone that might have academia and some other who might do uh, repairs and maintenance 
equally important. We're all part of, we're all cogwheels in the same machinery here, but um, sometimes having different functions may create a sense of misunderstanding, so we have to be cautious. Decentralized workplaces, we just kind of talked about that off-site sites. Um, and workplaces that rely on customer service or satisfaction, sometimes we have to kind of keep a particular, like that Disney uh, employee face on all the time, and sometimes it's difficult for us to um, move forward. Now, these things being present doesn't mean that there's harassment. These are not predictors of, it's just it could possibly happen here, right? So you as a manager, supervisor, department head, or potential of any of these, um, my suggestion is to foster a culture of respect and support. It's already difficult to sometimes have to deal with the pressures that we sometimes are placed, or are placed on us to get things done, to get reports done, to get uh, student numbers up, which is all normal parts of a university, right? But if we can work with respect, it will make it such a more pleasant place to come to work in, right? Um, make policies available to your employees so they understand what's expected of them and how they could, uh, if need be, file the complaint. Encourage immediate reporting. Please don't wait, although our policy, and you'll see in a moment, does not have a time limit to when you can file a sexual complaint, sexual harassment complaint. So it could have happened several years ago. There's no time policy. You could file it today if you needed to. And ensure an environment that's free of retaliation. Ensure your team members, your employees that work with you, your fellow colleagues, that they're not going to be retaliated against. So let's just watch a really quick clip on how to foster respect. <laughs> Civility is a thing of the past, a friend of mine lamented over coffee one day. I expected her to go on and cite the current political landscape or a viral Facebook video, but instead she described her workplace. Every Friday morning, she and her coworkers file into the conference room with their heads and spirits down. They brace themselves for the storm as their boss brings the meeting to order with a bombardment of verbal rants and public humiliations. After two years of these stormy Fridays and other tirades, she's ready to see some sun. Fortunately, most leaders aren't the cause of such storms. Sometimes disrespect and incivility flourish because leaders don't make respect part of the culture. Other times it's due to inattention. Yet intuitively, most leaders understand the correlation between respect and high performance. According to the Society for Human Resource Management's annual survey, Respect for employees is the most important contributor to job satisfaction. 65% of respondents deemed it very important, but only 38% said they were very satisfied. And trust is number two. Trust between employees and senior management is gaining importance. What does all this mean? It means that leaders need to pay attention to the level of respect and trust that percolates through their organization. It's not about adding anything else to your already overflowing plate. It's not a box on a compliance training checklist or another task to add to your to-do list. Building a culture of respect and trust needs to become part of your day-to-day. -day. So what can you do? Consider these six ideas for building a culture of respect and trust. Number one, be the first in line. Like it or not, your employees are watching what you say and do. They assess whether your actions match your words. Training about unconscious bias, diversity, and inclusion, harassment, and bullying is important. But talking about these difficult topics is not enough. Your participation is critical. Number two, make respect a core value. Talk about it. Offer training. Make sure your employees know you will not tolerate gossip, harassing, bullying, or any other negative or disrespectful behaviors in the workplace. Number three, make employees responsible for maintaining a respectful workplace. While it's true that you set the tone, the responsibility for a respectful work environment does not fall solely on your shoulders. Hold your employees accountable for respectful behaviors. Number four, diversity is not enough. Focus on inclusion. Listen without interruption. Encourage employees to share ideas and opinions. Let your employees know that you value the contributions. Encourage team members to collaborate and work together. Number five, show you care. Your employees are more than the role they perform in your department. 
They are people first and workers second. Ask about them. Spending a couple minutes connecting with your employees as people first can go a long way toward building trust. Number six, strive for fairness and transparency. Not all company decisions, goals, and strategies can be immediately shared, of course. But it's important to acknowledge things when they are happening, even if you can't go into details. Regardless of how respectful your work environment currently is, it's important to remember that building and maintaining a culture of respect and trust begins with you. It takes intention and commitment, but it's worth it. It's a win-win for the employees and the organization. So what if you don't create an environment of respect and trust? What can potentially happen to your department? Not all at once. I can't hear you. Um, thank you. Yes, someone said you could potentially have attrition and people could leave. How long does it normally take to train someone in your department to do what his or her function is? And how difficult would it be to have to train somebody new? And if in your particular department, the atmosphere is not one of respect and trust, do you think that the remaining employees and team members are gonna be encouraging of the new person or warn them? So create in your particular workplace respect and trust. If we're gonna have to be here, and this by the way, is where you spend the bulk of your waking hours, and Tony seems to sleep here, the poor guy, I always see him, thank you Tony. Tony is our uh, in-house painter, Michelangelo we call him. So, <laughs> uh, so you know, we spend the bulk of our waking hours here. We, we, we might wanna enjoy and be respectful of each other so we could you know, move forward and do the right thing and, and support each other. Because if the, in the place where you spend the bulk of your waking hours, you don't support each other, it doesn't make for a really good quality of life, right? So if we could do this for each other, I think it would go a long way, just, in the, just in, the, in the respect and trust area. So as a manager, provide trainings. On occasion, you know, let the, your employees know and clear up what harassment is and isn't. It's important. What the consequences for harassing behaviors are and be consistent. Clear instructions on how to follow a complaint. We're gonna talk about that and you should keep that policy in your department. Uh, so in case there's any questions, you could certainly uh, quickly refer to it. Tailor to your specific workplace and the people you work with. There might be a particular language you have to use or a particular way to set it up. And then conduct on a regular basis a, a booster shot of training, if you will. Right? So when you receive a complaint, if you're a supervisor or manager or a coworker who might be have, may have been placed temporarily in that position, assure that person confidentiality that what is said will stay there, right? Take prompt action. Make sure that you're quick in getting everything through the process. Keep an open mind and don't be quick to jump to conclusions. It may not be a factual case. It may not be an accurate complaint. There may have been something that, that could be resolved with a discussion, but keep an open mind. Don't jump to conclusions. Do, however, formally keep a record of the discussion when it happened who was present if you could get people that uh, came to you to sign and and sign affidavits it's important to make sure that you're prepared for if and when something further happens treat the person very respectfully there might be people that you might presume to be very sensitive but it's their level and their right and choice to be sensitive it may not be right for you right but it's how they seem to feel and that's how they perceive what's happening. Please treat them respectfully because I don't want you to be someone who injures them just because they're coming to you for help and assistance. And then please follow the company of policy. So um, if you have an interview that you have to take, be prompt. Uh, interview the individual who files the complaints and any witnesses that were available. That's why your um, documentation is important of who was there. Communicate the decision individually and privately to the person and to those affected. Please don't make a public service announcement in your department because you remember it's supposed to be kept confidential and enforce any disciplinary action that's required. If you, as a manager or an employee, are accused, cooperate with the investigation. That's the best way to protect yourself. You give your statement. Even if it's a statement that denies what occurred, you give your statement, it's important. Adjust your behavior to ensure that you don't keep aggravating whatever you're being accused of 
you know, you don't keep, keep aggravating. Don't retaliate against that person. If you feel uncomfortable having to work with that person, you might want to request a reassignment or working somewhere else if your particular job permits for you to do that. Uh, treat the complaining employee respectfully. So if your coworker, a supervisor, whomever's complaining against you, please give them the respect that they deserve and maintain confidentiality. I know that when something big happens to us, we have to share it because it's too much information to hold on to. But be cautious of sharing it here. Because remember, uh, it disperses quite quickly and it could dilute your particular case. So be very careful with it. So this is your university policy. The policy applies to every faculty member, employee, student, applicants for employment or enrollment, contractors, guests, clients in the uh, Goodman Center, anybody who steps foot here, right? Um, moving forward here real quick um, to number three. Let me get it over here. Confidentiality. Only those that have legitimate reasons in terms of being involved should have access to this. Only those, right? So... Um, the following things will create sanctions and maybe even dismissal and termination. A needless, needless publishing of information regarding what happened, so dispersing and gossip what occurred. Now you're possibly um, going to be sanctioned or maybe even dismissed for that. Compromising the integrity of the grievance process. Failing to report sexual harassment um, to the person that's designated for you to report it to. And making false statements to the institution regarding sexual harassment. There is no time limit to false sexual harassment or, discri or discrimination grievances here. And any form or manner of retaliation or threat of retaliation against the complainant or a witness is prohibited and will have sanctions. So, um, oops, hold on a second. In any situation that has to do with um, students or prospective students, or yeah, it's the dean of students that we report to when it's a, a complaint, when it's a sexual harassment complaint. All employees, including faculty, applicants for employment, uh, go to Carmen Garcia, the human resource director here. And any guests or contractors and vendors that come here would file their complaint with the executive director of finance and administration. These are the people that we would go to. If you have any questions, ask Carmen. She'll direct you to the right place. So any questions? Thank you for staying awake. It's not a fun topic, but it's a topic that we need to discuss to make sure that you're protected and that you have the venues and know exactly what to do should you be the victim of something like that here, which I hope is not the case. Because there's so many people here, sometimes we may inadvertently say things or do things. If someone tells you, I'm uncomfortable with that, please stop that behavior. Stop it so that you can prevent the institution from getting into any trouble and more importantly, you getting into any trouble. It's important. Thank you. Any